Wow, Star Fox 64. When I say the title, what is one thing that comes to mind? Maybe it's Branching Paths? The Landmaster? Oh, I got it. How about Slippy? Whatever you remember Star Fox 64 by, it's memorable in so many ways. When I think of the game, I think back of the screen that displays all of the planets in the Lilat system. That sounds ridiculous, especially as the first thing that I remember, but I remember being wowed by the fact that you could actually see the planets that exist on your current route before you get to them, all posited within a star-clustered space grid. And with the planets that you couldn't reach, there was always something intriguing about them and what you had to do to get to them. So, while in the original Star Fox, there are three selectable level paths, there are a total of 25 different planetary trajectories based on 64's level progression system. 25? Hot damn! Could only imagine what Peppy would say about that. In any case, that type of variety is something to write home about, especially for a game that's 22 years old. Despite all of these trajectories, there are still three primary level paths that construct this game's narrative, each of which is color-coded for their respective difficulty. Blue for easy, yellow for medium, and red for hard. Now, I'd like to make a disclaimer. I worry sometimes that by calling these narrative analyses, people are going to think that I put the plot of Star Fox on a pedestal. In truth, I don't. I could summarize the story arc for just about every Star Fox game in two words, defeat and dross. But that's not spectacular, nor is it the game's narrative. The narrative includes the sequence of events that are built up to achieve that plot and its outcome, so thereby defining the process that leads up to that story arc. So in my lens, narrative includes everything from the environments to the characters, and for this game especially, cinematography, as exemplified through dialogue and these beautiful sequences where you just get to watch the game unfold. And one other aspect that I would like to bring up is the combat. While I don't know that gameplay is necessarily a narrative component, in this game, I think it helps define its identity, and thus the narrative of Star Fox 64. So in today's narrative analysis, I am going to dictate and closely examine the extent to which these factors and more combine to create the spectacular and memorable experience that is Star Fox 64. I'm your sworn brother, and today, let's fly through the narrative elements of this iconic landmark, or should I say, land. Master. I could not resist that. Level 1. An easy path. And a memorable one. Message from General Pepper. Priority one. We need your help, Star Fox. Andros has declared war. He's invaded the Lilat system and is trying to take over Corneria. Our army alone can't do the job. Hurry, Star Fox.
The intro sequence. Space. How epic. Rob comes in with a message from General Pepper. Urgency. Importance. These are the concepts communicated as we listen to Pepper's briefing. Their army alone can't do the job. Fox, in fact, Team Fox, hurries to their R-wings and we get a close-up. This is so cool. Compare this to the Super Nintendo representations of Star Fox for a minute. Yeah. Uh huh. That's right. That's Slippy. You know, the toad? Now just feast your eyes on the beauty of Team Fox and how lifelike they are on the Nintendo 64. I know Fox is supposed to have chicken legs or whatever, but my gosh. Does he run to his R-Wing with style and grace? Even the R-Wing gets a dramatic title. Now that is an intro sequence. And now to the text scrawl. Corneria, fourth planet of the Lilat system. Who is this narrator? His voice is incredible. I have goals to aspire towards. Actually, wait. I have goals to aspire toward. Not quite as close. Regardless, the narrative of Star Fox 64 is relayed by this unnecessarily cool narrator as an R-wing rotates slowly alongside the moving text. A slow fade. Feast your eyes on the Lilat system. Now I remember this. I remember how every planet is laid out in front of you. In retrospect, this is so much cooler than the Super Nintendo's version of the Lilat system where you just pick the level path on a bland blue screen. In 64, your flight trajectory is not determined on the path that you select, but based on how well you play. And Fox is about to put that to the test in his home planet, Corneria. Do a barrel roll. Is that all anyone remembers this level, Brian? Well, either way, this level is iconic. Now, let's reflect for a moment. Super Nintendo Corneria. Team Fox scrambles. Top Gun soundtrack. <laughs> Buildings, structures. Now fast forward to 64. Open the wing. Once again, so much cooler. I guess the right way to describe it would be cinematic. The camera does a nice close-up of each of the R-Wings as their pilots give us a bit of dialogue. We really feel like we are part of a team. Once the cutscene is over, the R-Wing is free to be played with. You have a few seconds to move up, down, left, right, skim across water, and actually see your reflection before the enemy units start coming in. After that, it's a straight shot to the end boss. Corneria on the Super Nintendo was cool in its own right, but this, this is intense in a different way. So with Star Fox 64, you do have that classic 64 fog polluting the environment. If you did play this on the 3DS, it does look a lot better. Regardless, it actually gives the feeling that Corneria is being destroyed. You've got robots that are pushing over the buildings, ground turrets on bridges and railways, while more robots throw pillars at you. Something's wrong with the G-Diffuser. Falco's anyway. Just as you're learning to pilot your R-Wing, your team is learning theirs. Outside of Falco's minor hiccup, it's not long before you take it to the enemy, Granga's mech. Here the game switches to all range mode. This entails fighting in a fixed grid with the incompetent monkey in his mech, and after a few shots to the back battery, he goes down easy. I think this level's boss is intentionally easy, because it's the route that you take if you either can't save Falco and or don't fly through the arches, meaning you're still learning the ropes. It also serves as narrative fodder. So like the first game, Corneria is invaded by machines and mech-like units. Granga is a walking target, and it's fair to presume that this monkey is in charge of the pillaging of Corneria. Thus, we can infer that he wasn't actually built to attack you, 
most danger you are going to be in is if you just fly directly into his mech. Were you even paying attention? This Corneria is not the Corneria of the previous game, despite the thematic connections. Yes, you are the protectors of the planet, but this version depicts pillaging and destruction in ways that its predecessor hadn't fathomed. Along the way, you learn useful maneuvers like somersaults, boosts, and barrel rolls. Actually, should I say them like Peppy does? Try a somersault! <laughs> Any chance to repeat Star Fox 64 dialogue? I'll take it. By utilizing them to their fullest, you have a chance to do a real number on the enemy units. The metal score is attained at 150 hits or higher. Note that bonus hits are obtained for attacking more difficult units or locking on to enemies with one charge shot and taking down several of them in the process. Corneria's hit counter is moderate by comparison to the other levels in the game, but it still signifies a noteworthy enemy presence. As Team Fox's homecoming battle, they make a bold statement about Team Fox's ability and their identities as the hometown heroes. Enemy robot, get ahead! Let's go! Medio. Whoa! Here comes a big one! <laughs> I can't stop with the dialogue, but you know me. I love my 64 dialogue. Great Fox leads the pack, crushing asteroids like they're not. Slippy calls it as it is. Things are starting to heat up. And he ain't wrong. This is the quintessential asteroid field. There's a ton of enemy variety, from destructible asteroids to snake creatures, and packs of four to five aircraft at a time. There are a couple of big moments in this stage as well, notably with the indestructible asteroids. Early in the stage, the pressure is cooking once the massive asteroids come on screen. They communicate danger and could easily result in a destroyed wing or two. Navigating around these asteroids requires knowing how to use the other features of the R-Wing, like the boost, the brake, and it sounds self-explanatory, but in the heat of the moment on a 64 controller, this can actually be daunting in the best way possible. The other notable segment for Meteo entails warp panels. This occurs after a checkpoint. Successively flying through each of them results in a level warp to a field of many destructible asteroids. The problem is that the ship moves faster with each panel that's used. I've never done this sequence successfully, and it's part of the reason I can't beat Star Fox Command, but the idea of a quote-unquote secret path is amazing, and I always try for it, given the chance. Fail to fly through the warp panels, and players are flown directly to the enemy leader, Meteo Crusher. Sound familiar? If you know the Super Nintendo game, it should. This is a spiritual remake of Rock Crusher that actually plays more similar to Blade Barrier. He has three phases and taunts Fox through each of them. The first phase entails shooting weak points revealed beneath a shield. Shoot the shield, and the lasers reflect at you. When the weak points are destroyed, the shield is flung out at Fox, and his core is exposed and easily destroyed. The pilot then feigns destruction, but his lies seep through his teeth. I mean, he does say we look stupid. The weak points are exposed yet again, and he's taken down with ease. This boss is a bit of a slog. It requires waiting and listening to the enemy's banter through each of the phases. Per the narrative, it works, because he's only meant to hold you up. Pepper briefed Fox to watch out for enemies in the asteroid field before the mission commenced. Instead, this one watched out for Fox and followed from behind to obstruct his path. It's a shame the boss doesn't hold a candle to the concept of everything in the asteroid field before it. There's no danger here. There's no fast-paced action. But the contrast establishes the boss's presence as a nag. Plus, all that nagging makes his explosion and end remark that much more satisfying in the end. Fortuna. 
Hello, old friend. Z. Recover the base. Here's where Star Fox 64 starts to get tactical. Players got a taste of all range mode in Corneria. Fortuna is the real deal, and Falco is loving it. You're dead meat, pal. The first half of the battle entails taking out the grunts. They don't give much of a challenge, but finding ones to down can be tricky. It actually feels empty and unclear what to do besides fly around until Team Fox dialogue about the base progresses Fortuna past that grunt stage. A bomb has been planted at the base. Jeez, can anyone take care of it? Can't let you do that, Star Fox. Enter Star Wolf. Damn, things got heated in a second. Fortuna changes from Baron to a straight-up dogfight in the brink of a cutscene. The map radar goes from a bunch of harmless white dots to four lurking shadows of enemy aircraft. Wolf O'Donnell, Leon Pawelski, Pig Madangar, and Andrew Oikani. Team Fox has a nemesis, Star Wolf. Fox even speaks of Wolf like he's a bad dog from the Academy. I think what's so cool here is that each member of Star Fox has a logical, corresponding rival. It's not spelled out, but Peppy and Pigma used to be on the same team. Leon and Slippy could be reptilian relatives. Falco and Andrew, Andros' nephew, have supposed credentials. And obviously, Fox vs. Wolf. They don't go down easy, either. Even with a max laser upgrade, Fox fires focus blasts at consistent rates to protect his team and recover the base. Fortuna in the original Star Fox was vastly different from this one. Littered with dinosaurs and massive creatures, none of that is to be found here. 64's Fortuna is a portioned off base on the snowy side of the planet. I think it's really drab by comparison, but the addition of Star Wolf is iconic. So the first game made you feel like a pilot and part of a team by flying alongside your pals, while 64 thickens the plot by introducing characters of a similar nature but bad blood. Even the theme song changes when they roll out midway through the level. Additionally, they're no slouches either. Your own teammates can barely handle them. It's really hard to quantify which Fortuna is stronger in a narrative sense. From a sci-fi lens, the original, hands down, but from cinematic, 64 takes the cake. Which one do you prefer? All aircraft report. Hey, we made it! Fox, take it easy. That was a close call, Fox. 6. Rubbish Pile Here comes the enemy fleet. Pshew! Not anymore. So we're off to find a secret weapon, eh? Well, we gotta dig through a pile of trash to get there. Hey, one marsupial's trash is still trash. This level is littered with space wreckage and a ton of enemy units. These fellas ain't much of a threat, but boy is Falco right. Enemy group behind us! Actually, there's so damn many, I nearly lost my ship. Ain't this supposed to be the easy route? Well, whatever. I'm just glad a bit of challenge still is here. In the Shmuplation 93 interview, Miyamoto-san said he worried that he made the original game too hard. In this one, it usually seems too easy. Speaking of which, what the hell, Peppy? How did you end up with all those guys on your ass? I never even had a chance to save him. Not even by a hair. Yeah. Now look at this level. There's a spinning trash. Flying fists. Turrets. Based on the flip sides of walls and other platforms. Sector X is introduced as the combat zone. And this stage is full of it. The hit counter for the metal is a moderate 150. But I had way more than that prior to the boss. But that boss has another trick up its arms. Spyborg. Andros, secret weapon. Fun fact time. The Japanese name for Spyborg is HVC-09, three units away from ROB serial number, HVC-12. Whatever. Thing's still creepy. It comes off as Andros robot lackey without a thought or a brain. 
Where is the creator? What's he saying? Where is the creator? Seriously, where is your creator? He should have given you a pair of legs. Let me do you the favor and blast that head off real fast. Yippee! You did it! Not so fast, Slip. I'm going to wait for this guy to explode. Nope. He ain't dead. The view is clear. I just blew your head off. Falco's proven pretty apt overall in terms of his remarks. So I'm supposed to be aiming at his neck or something? What's well, going all right? But something's wrong with the Jeter future. Oh, yay! Here comes Slippy! Let me handle this! Slippy! Slippy? What the fuck? Why would you fly so close to that thing? Didn't you learn anything in the academy? It's an on-rail stage. Are you even a pilot? Maybe you should stick to analyzing. Actually, that's kind of ironic because that's exactly what I'm doing. In any case, boom, take that spyboard. I gotta say, I appreciate Sector X for coming in with the challenging on-rails gameplay. Lots of fast enemy units, and I nearly got downed. I barely felt challenged through most of the playthrough, so Sector X was a breath of fresh air. So was Falco with his quips. Slippy can be such a headache sometimes. Seriously, no fucks given. And I love it. Titania, a sci-fi classic. The Landmaster has landed. You know, I like this thing. The Landmaster gives variety to the gameplay. You have a base power, so you never feel overpowered. And you can hover. The enemies and environments remind me what I like so much about Fortuna in the first game. Massive sand crabs, enemy mines, laser turrets. Oh gosh, this level may have the best aesthetic qualities in the game. To complement it, the Landmaster is slow. It's uncomfortable. It's castrating in a way because Fox is so accustomed to the R-Wing. So I'm pretty good at the game, and even I was taking some hits here. I love the segments where the buildings start collapsing like dominoes, and you have to boost, roll, and do everything you can to avoid them. To further complicate things, Falco's having trouble in the sky. That means you have to aim in a completely different terrain to save your pal. I'm beginning to like Falco. That's my boy right there, so I can't let nobody mess with him. Then, all of a sudden, Slippy. Ah, I'm hit. Hey, I'm coming. Oh, look, you just got caught in the branches, eh? Oh, shit, what is that? This is the coolest monster in the game. Goros. <laughs> Sounds a bit like Goran, except it's not. Goras uses Slippy as a shield until you take down his arms. It takes a while, but once you disarm him, get it? Disarm? Ha <laughs> ha. He's going to try and close you off. Slippy, what are you doing? Hurry up! Oh yeah, this is like Monarch Dodra in the first game, except boy, you gotta make that tank float. I'm firing off Nova bombs like it's Lila Independence Day. Don't believe me? Count them. Oh shit, his arms are coming back. No matter, I almost got this thing. The core is exposed and I'm out for vengeance. Titania in the first game was puzzle based. And I guess Professor Hangar was pretty cool too. But damn, is this stage all around solid. I actually think it's more of a remake of Fortuna than it is the Titania. First off, it is like a side quest. You were never meant to fly here in the first place. You were here to save Slippy because he couldn't quit dinking around. You had to do it in a frickin' Landmaster during a magnetic storm and fight this mortifying creature. No offense, Goros, but man, it's like the odds are against you. And the feeling created is reminiscent. Reminiscent of how great that first game was at creating something uncanny and uncomfortable. I like this version of Titania. This is more in line with the sci-fi narrative.
both see laser go round you start the stage and whoa which way am i going this defense outpost has a gravitational pull created by six energy towers the towers are protecting a satellite that is your sole barrier to venom you gotta do some seriously weird flying here to proceed i'll cover you fox once the satellite's exposed a bunch of enemies fly out too suddenly even though the whole squad is back it seems like they're all getting tailed what is up guys gravity is back to normal you know anyway let's take out this core it's called the bolts defense system and it's supposedly pretty dangerous every time a panel is shot off the remnant fires off wild laser fire there's a total of 12 laser panels so once you start getting closer to the last one the satellite becomes a huge hazard to get near the level makes it worth your while though awarding 10 hits per panel the going is not so tough since Fox wants to head to Venom and take his crew home. Personally, I think Bolts is a little weak in terms of the narrative. I get that it's a satellite, but the merry-go-round flying thing is not worth writing home about. The laser satellite's interesting, but it's also lacking in personality. And at the end of the day, the level is only meant to function as an obstruction to Andros. It's handled better on the medium route, but we'll talk about that when we get there. For now, let's head out on one last stop. Time for a little payback. Venom, here we come. Venom. Classic. Fight and flight. Let me start by saying that Venom is never a letdown. Look at all the ships so early on. If I had a Nova bomb, I'd have fired two. Falco's right. These guys are everywhere. Whoa, what the heck? I know that's a Star Wolf quote, but it applies here. The flight paths have some real obstacles. It's not long before you have to start deciding which path you're going to take. Normally, it's not a big deal. But... Your pilots split up too. And I gotta tell you, when the choices are between Falco and Peppy, I'm on Team Falco. What's that? Slippy going left? Well, you know where I'm headed. Einstein, I'm on your side! Hold on a sec. Rob's paging. What? Andros? How'd you get this number? I'm hanging up. We come across this Mayan temple looking thing and end up chasing this monkey robot through one corridor, Gold Mech. Interesting title. This creature lures Fox down the hall so that he can thrash pillars and sediment out of the wall at his R wing. Taking him down requires shooting his corresponding body parts from the head to the toes. Don't get too close, Fox. When all is done and said, Golem Mech falls down after getting shot from a distance, exploding in a magnificent fashion. Fox ends up back outside, somehow, and goes ship first into Andros Man Cave. As a lead up to the end boss, it's pretty cool, but again, a light narrative component. What really stood out to me here was how the level demanded such quick decision amid its flying segments. Even the emerging pillars in the Golem Mech battle require some quick flying. But enough of that. Andros. The tunnel is long, but it's open. It leaves little room for error. In fact, what's up with all the upgrades scattered down the hall? Maybe Andros is feeling generous. He does throw some heavy remarks in there. In the original Star Fox, Andros simply implied a bout with Papa McCloud, and that was only on the hard route. Here we are on the easy path, and Andros is full of himself telling Fox how he's going to die like his father. Die just like your father. Yeah, right. Andros, we know the drill. Just because you sprouted some hands doesn't mean you can psych me out. Shoot the eyes. Expose the hands. Now let's face off. What? 
Hungry for some rocks? Well, don't confuse them with Fox, because we're not on the menu. Oh, I guess he doesn't like rocks. Well, that's too bad, because we're shooting them right back in that stupid face of his. Oh, shoot, what's that behind the face? A robot head? And it's coming straight for me? Well, goddamn, no one hits him a cloud and gets away with it. Pew, pew! And that's that. Bye-bye, Andros. In fact, bye-bye, Venom. This was a solid bout round and round, but way too easy. Yes, this is the easy route, but for a robotic scientist, he hardly tried. Here's the thing about the level one path. Yes, it was easy, but it was also memorable for so many reasons. Corneria will always be the staple of the series, so even though it's underwhelming, it gives Fox and friends a chance to get to know each other and their ships. The asteroid belt is full of surprises, including a potential warp point, so even though the boss is lackluster, the actual level makes up for it. Fortuna is an instant classic. It's the first bout with Fox's not just rival, but rivals, one per team member. The first game didn't do anything like that. Sector X is a throwback to the space rubble of sectors Y and Z from the original game, and a boss that straight up pimp slaps Slippy into arguably the strongest planet narrative-wise in the game, Titania. Bols is admittedly forgettable, but a setup for the enemy-laden Venom ground space. So yeah, Andros wasn't much of a final boss by comparison, but can I really be mad? The easy path offered so much potential in its narrative components. It has strong character development between Star Fox friendly banters and the quote-unquote slip-up, environmentally sound locations in Medio and Titania especially, and a number of cinematic entrances and explosions solidifying Star Fox presence as badass pilots to be reckoned with. Is it any surprise then how interested I am to see how the medium and hard paths compare? Let's find out. The Medium Path, a happy medium. Andros is a punk, and his face annoys me, especially in the game's end credits. So we're out on a new path to try and eradicate him. Lasers first. The new path has the same starting point, Corneria. Let's do it. I'll do my best. Andros won't have his way with me. You tell him, Fox. Again, I love how cinematic Corneria is. Our wings flying out, classic dialogue, everything we mentioned before, and more. Something's wrong with the G diffuser. One major difference from the easy playthrough is that to progress along a new path, Fox has to do the following. Save Falco when his G diffusers go down, and fly under the arches midway through the level. It's not stated explicitly that anyone has to do this. But the inquisitive mind and person who enjoys acrobatic flying will probably do this anyway. Do so, and Falco pays you a compliment. Unexpected and pretty nice. I am a pretty smooth flyer. Falco knows me too well. He also finds the target and leads us through a waterfall, past jumping landmines. Pepe comes in with the briefing. Incoming enemy from the rear, drop altitude. Oh, snap. Long time no see. Attack Carrier has made a comeback from the original game. Battle is just as easy, but I love the exaggerated, raspy, alligator voice behind the target. Alright, so let's talk narrative consistency for a moment. The previous target in 64 Corneria was a mech, and it didn't pose any threat whatsoever to Fox. Unless you have no idea how to operate in all-range mode. The Attack Carrier has never been a threat. In the original Star Fox, nor is it one here. But since it is an attack carrier, we can presume it's mostly a boarding mechanism for the enemies on Corneria. I draw some contention here because there is no real challenge in either of the bosses on Corneria 64. At least with the Super Nintendo version, the difficult path did have a relatively challenging enemy leader, but this is a bit too easy either direction. The highlight of Corneria remains flying through the level. Let's see how the rest of the new path follows suit. 
We're heading out. All aircraft report. Sector Y. Enemies galore. Alright, time to do a little game shout out. Anyone played Omega Boost? This level reminds me quite a bit of that, mostly because of the mech units and how they strafe, maneuver, and propel through the level. Sector Y has a decent number of units, but feels more intense than Medio due to the volumes of laser fire. The Monkey Mechs also provide added challenge in their increased durability. They reward Fox with added hits to his counter. Medio was intense due to environmental obstructions, but Sector Y is populated with masses of military might. It culminates in a heated battle with two mechs in all range mode. I'm just learning that they are called Shogun Warriors. Despite that, they're more like Shogun Fleas. Focus your aiming, take them out, and the Shogun Warlord appears. Straight out of Brooklyn with the accent. Don't party just yet. The Warlord shows he can take a hit. One thing he can't do is take 20. A bit of a lengthy bout if you can't take him out off the bat, but the Warlord is taking the L today. Okay, now Sector Y is a bit underwhelming, but the all range mode segment at the end is okay. I like that we get new enemy units that aren't just spaceships. The mech purposes are unclear, but based on the floating debris in the level, they could serve as construction workers. I don't know for sure, but they're certainly not deserving of the title Shogun. Not a bad level, but it does leave a bit to be desired. Your skills have improved, Fox! I guess you're good for something. Alright, I know Fox said we're going to Aquas, but that's not the case. There is no pre-selectable middle path, per se. You have to either opt out of the hard path after accomplishing Sector Y, or warp from the asteroid belt to take the middle path in its entirety. It's much easier to just fly out of Sector Y than accomplish the warp. So here we are at our next planet, Katina. It's your boy. Bill. Oh boy, back in Lilad school, you remember those days? We used to slobber thinking about those female cadets. Oh, how the times have changed. Okay, I have a love-hate relationship with Slippy. Jokes aside, Katina is full of ships. It's almost impossible to distinguish who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. The only luck I had here was charging up a laser blast to lock onto enemy units, and even that wasn't flawless. I still managed to hit a couple good guys. If you are going for a no-friendly fire run, this is not the path to take. It doesn't matter much since you'll eventually run into the mothership. Just wait for the name, Saucerer. I don't know, it could use more sauce if you ask me. According to Nintendo Power, Saucerer carries several hundred fighters. Really? Where are they all? There's a decent number, but not more than enough to net a triple digit score off them alone. The mothership is the primary target here with four hatches harboring a powerful weapon to destroy the base. The four hatches open in time segments and Bill alerts Fox when they're open. The hatches are open. The fact that the hatch's openings are time-based is annoying because to get to the mothership, Fox has to keep rolling around the level. The fight drags on a bit, but it is over before the ship gets a chance to become a real threat. So let's talk narrative. Bill is a cool supplemental character. Is it because of his sunglasses? Maybe. I am a little biased. It's not that Bill does anything particularly significant in Katina, but after having the same company for the entirety of the easy path, a new face is welcome. His dialogue is welcome and assists in the battle, and it's not his last one either. We also learn that Katina is an allied planet. This is significant in the scope of the map because Katina is in a one planet proximity from Corneria. Despite this, it still gets deployed a high number of enemy units. Bill and his team manage the battle for the first half of the fight, but once Saucerer starts dropping the sauce, they can't keep up. The battle is more so a nuisance than it is challenging, 
but the context behind Bill and Katina lend the battle a sense of importance and desire to protect this planet. In that sense, I would argue that it succeeds at helping the Lilat system to come more alive. Bill. Now we're taken to solar. Get out the kitchen. Why? Because it's hot. Ooh, 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 my coffee. It just burned my lip. And solar burned my ship. Slippy hypes up the Arwing conditions while taking residual damage. This baby can take temperatures up to 9,000 degrees. There's some irony in that. Despite that, I still take my coffee hot. And I like the level. The Arwing takes environmental damage from the magma, making it imperative to fly high. If you saved Katina on the previous planet, your boy Bill drops some health rings for the team. My boy. This stage is flat out fantastic. There are magma phoenixes flying out of the lava in droves, asteroids splurging health rings when destroyed, and snakes of fiery ash to fly around. My favorite portions of this level involve firing nova bombs at the swarms of magma phoenixes as they emerge from varying corners of the screen. But to top it off, the enemy bioweapon, Volcane, is a significant battle. This is the enemy's bioweapon? It houses a hard outer shell casing that has to be exposed in increments via his prawn like pincers. Don't forget, you can't fly too low unless you're okay with taking some damage. Volcane will spew asteroids from his mouth head first towards your ship. He'll also spin in a cyclone and dolphin dive, making the lava rise in waves to hit your R wing. Can we appreciate how impressive that is? Your R wing is airborne and the waves are rising to the height of your ship. This creature is a serious threat in the moment. In terms of narrative, Planet Solar begs the question, why? Why is Team Fox flying here? The answer actually lies in the map. Solar is directly en route to Venom. Yes, the other two courses have their share of challenges, but gradual heat damage affects the entire team on Solar. I'm half surprised Team Fox made it out alive from the level at all. When I was younger and inexperienced at gaming, I used to dread going through this planet because I used to be the one dying. Now, as a veteran Lilat fighter, Solar is one of my favorites. The environmental hazards create authentic challenge and naturally follow up with a difficult boss battle, one which doesn't even need dialogue to cement its presence as a dangerous opponent. If more stages in the game were as creative and engaging as this one, 64 would assert itself as a true and tried tribute to the original game and the sci-fi spaceship shooting genre. Macbeth, all aboard. Macbeth. There's only one question to ask here. How's the land master, Spock? Slippy, I love this thing. I did explain it with Titania, but here it's even more cool. The Landmaster is crippling because Fox is so used to his R-Wing. But the primary target in this game involves a train chase. The Landmaster is a natural competitor to the locomotive as both are ground-based. While Titania had felt alien sci-fi-like in the same way that Solar does, Macbeth is closer to a military outing. Even the name insinuates bloodshed. The combat here is great. Fire at oncoming boulders rolling in synchronized patterns. Shoot the cargo on board the train. Fire at units at all sorts of altitudes. The boss, Macbeth, is also present and commenting to Fox for the entire duration of the level. I'm a little closer. Let's talk about Macbeth for a minute. He's nicknamed the Forever Train at the beginning of the level. The identity of Macbeth is important here, Venom's supply base. It's only natural that the boss do everything in his power to stop Fox. He's actually quite a difficult boss to face in his entirety, but Fox can avoid the whole battle by simply flicking some switches. Don't get it twisted though, hitting all eight switches means seeing them all, 
And even without the Star Fox 64 fog, you have to barrel roll through the level and fire rapidly at obstacles just to expose the switches. Trust me, you'll want to do this as the end sequence is climactic and the hit plus counter is much welcome. Macbeth succeeds on every front. It makes the Landmaster feel competent in spite of its incompetencies, namely hover range and laser power. The boss establishes its own power, rightfully so considering its position as Andros supply defender, and he won't let Fox take all the glory, even if he does go for the easy way out. The cinematic ending is also fun to watch every time, and the nature of unlocking it makes players feel like they really worked for it. Macbeth is another competent stage for the medium difficulty path, especially considering how it follows up with Solar's relative difficulty. Step home again. Let's go it, Fox! No! Get the way! Stop it! Bolts. The satellite revolves yet again. And here we are yet again on the boring barrier planet flying around the same gravity-based grid. Yawn. I have the same complaints here as I did last time, so let's just breeze through this. Your carcass is mine. Jeez, Slippy. Your mind is foul. It takes some flying, pausing, shooting, rinse, repeat, but the barrier towers go down easy. Then... Playtime is over, Star Fox. I think I'll talk to you for a while. Daddy screamed real good before he... You'll be sorry you crossed us. What the heck? It's Star Wolf, here to protect the barrier. Oh, that's cool. Since we never took out Wolf on Fortuna, they're here instead to protect the satellite. Unfortunately, you can abuse the slow nature of the enemy core and take out Star Wolf before the core goes full blast mode, but the Star Wolf battle is an added bonus here. Actually, I have very little else to say about Bolts even the second time around, primarily due to the slow nature of the level. Adding Star Wolf here is a great concept. They offer an added hit bonus of plus 40 in total, allowing Fox to earn the medal, but more importantly, they assert themselves as Andros' henchmen on more than just one path. And for that, I have to respect the differences the second time around. I won't let you get away from me! Also, for the medium version of both, Team Star Wolf are Andros' protectors more so than they are his lackeys. And though not as threatening as either Macbeth or Vulcane, they are versatile in availability. Andros can use them wherever he so pleases, either on the offensive or the defensive. A little pesky, but I do like them. Here's where I draw some contention with what the game does next. I just took the hard path for two planets to unlock a medium path. Bolts is considered the easy path, and I'm brought back to the exact same Venom to repeat the exact same sequence and take down Andros with no variations in the level at all, or the end credits. The original Star Fox was more competent in its designation of a medium path. There were differences in Corneria, the Asteroid Belt, and the end section for Venom. 64's is identical, and so I have no desire to revisit its narrative. I will say that 64's medium path had the most potential. The introduction of Bill was significant in establishing Fox's identity as a Lilat fighter. Macbeth and Solar are some of the best levels in the game. And it's great to see Star Wolf in a new context. For added bonus, 
I'll let you peep my high score as well. All in all, I'm a bit disappointed that the medium path couldn't deliver its own distinguished narrative and instead relies on the player choosing between the narratives of easy and hard. I understand that it's a bit of an anomaly, but I don't see why they couldn't have gone the extra mile to make the medium further distinguished from the easy and hard ones. Personally, I don't like that decision, but maybe you feel differently and you can let me know. The only thing I can hope is that the hard path does distinguish itself and its potential in terms of challenge. Let's find out. This is one steep bill, but it's worth it. This is one long vid, but it's worth it. <laughs> hey y'all, you sworn brother here. Just wishing y'all the best. I wanna show you my appreciation. I appreciate you, you at home, you viewing the video right now. Yes, you're incredible. Arigato gozaimasu. I appreciate you. And I appreciate the views, I appreciate the comments, and I appreciate the subscribers. If you're not already, take a moment and make sure you do subscribe. With that being said, we do have to wrap up the narrative analysis for Star Fox 64. And I am about to go into the hard route, and I want you to know that I'm about to go hard on it. And it's all out of love. You know, there's no sense in over-glamorizing a game and what it has to offer. Of course, if it's great, I'm going to show my appreciation. And you will see that I do still appreciate Star Fox 64. But I am a critic, and I'm critical of it. And there's no sense in hiding that. With that being said, I hope you are enjoying the narrative analysis and that it does have you thinking, because there is a lot to think about with these games, even when it doesn't seem like there is. I'm your sworn brother. And family comes first. Let's get back to that narrative analysis. Gee. <laughs> the hard path. Because it's outlined in red. Right? It's time. We're taking the hard path. Except the thing is, it's not really all that hard. Take, for instance, the first two levels. Corneria and Sector Y. These are identical to the previous playthrough on the quote-unquote medium path. And for that reason, I really see no need to revisit them. I will say I'm proud to have just earned a medal on Corneria in between playthroughs, though. Peppy thinks I'm becoming more like my father. I think I am one. Where do you stand? Never mind. Let's move on. Aquas. Atlantis at last. The Blue Marine. Is this thing in any other Star Fox game? <sighs> I hope not. I mentioned that the Landmaster was fun and crippled Fox in an exciting way. The Blue Marine is slow and awkward in a not-so-fun nor exciting way. Let's insert some slippy dialogue. How's the Blue Marine, Fox? Don't ask me that. Despite my personal bias against the vehicle, the stage is actually quite competent. It's somewhat difficult and beautiful. And actually, to see the beauty of the stage, you have to fire torpedoes. That's a novel concept here because the gimmick in the Landmaster stages was that you were doing ground-based combat. In Aquas, the gimmick is really that the stage is not visible and that your machine is 
somewhat clunky in the water. This thing will never hold together. And it makes you feel overwhelmed. I mean, shit, I felt overwhelmed as soon as you took my R-Wing away. The enemy bioweapon is a bit of a drag by comparison. It's a giant clam, and it's named Bakun. I'll let you try and parse that one out. Shoot the top parts. Shoot the tentacles. Fire torpedo. Rinse. Repeat. Bit of a boring battle in the grand scheme, and kind of a missed opportunity. I mean, think. For just a second, alright? We just piloted a submarine in the water and a polluted undersea city civilization. What kind of boss should this stage culminate in? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, um, like octopus, right? Like octopus with eight legs. And it's like, it feels massive by comparison. Or how about like, you know, a giant, sea eel that has like miniature sea eels or something like swims on varying stages of the game nope you're telling me a clam a clam was the best that the developers came up with that was the badass enemy bioweapon was an oversized clam all right next we're moving on We're preparing to dock. I'll take the sky any day. Cease, Falco. You too. Zone S. In the zone. Insert Peppy. This is Zona. I can't believe they did it. Whatever they did here, I love it. Zones has masses of enemy units flying out of the ocean, searchlights that warn the enemy leader of your presence, and the best side piece character yet. Did I mean to call her side piece? Nope, but I did. We're closing in on them, Falco. Take the right, my boy. I have the left. Cat, what are you doing here? Is that any way to greet a girl? Cat. Look, I have no idea who Cat is or why she addresses Falco and not me, the team leader. But she does have that cute little theme every time she enters the scene, and she actually helps to take out the searchlights. I'm thankful. When she gets in trouble, I really feel like I want to help her. Don't get spotted, though, in the process, because if you do, well, the enemy leader knows your presence, and then you're back to the medium path. And I think you have to go to Solar, which kind of sucks. Restart. Do yourself the favor. Chances are you have a decent number of lives by this point anyway. By the time you get to the end of Zone S, you're going to have close to around 200 hits, which is actually a two-life bonus. Despite this massive hit counter, it's still not enough for a medal. The combat on Zone S is absolutely fun, engaging, and a hearty challenge especially if you're intending to continue the hard path, since the spotlights are everywhere. The boss, Saru Marine, is by comparison on the easy side, but I wouldn't call him obvious. I like that it's not a simple shooting drill. You have to follow the clues as they appear to you. Shoot down the cannonballs that are fired from the upper half of the screen, and you'll get Nova Bomb upgrades, actually a ridiculous amount of them. You could totally just spend your time farming for Nova Bombs until you max out. After doing so, let's quote Peppy by saying, use bombs wisely, a.k.a. fire the bombs at the weak parts of the ship, which is primarily the exterior components. Everything is sequenced, too, so you can't just fire the bombs randomly. You can't just, like, take out the, the middle part. You have to, like, take out the crane before you take out the, the, um, the arms. My only real gripe here is that there's just so many Nova bombs at your disposal and even a decent number of silver rings that are going to appear that it never really feels like that difficult of a boss battle. So Siren Marine is not my favorite boss by a long shot, but he does keep you on your toes. 
especially in that the combat here is unorthodox. I like that its defenses are distinguished from the other bosses in the game. And the stage in its entirety is one of the most memorable ones to experience. You really have to work not just to get there, but to avoid the searchlights. And doing so will allow you to continue on the said hard path. That makes it a competent stage in my eyes. All aircraft report. I'm fine, I'm fine. Everything's A OK. Cat, where'd you go? Sector Z. Fire Z missiles. Get it? Z? Never mind. Enemy approaching from the left. We'll gladly take this one. Great Fox is under attack. Take a moment and appreciate the enemy attack pattern on the radar. So enemies actually swamp in on Great Fox. Again, another thing that makes all range mode feel somewhat tactical. Sector Z continues this trend to its best ability anyway. The player has to prioritize taking down a series of seven missiles despite a constant influx of grunt units that will constantly threaten you and your allies. Actually, it's a little bit stressful how much your allies are taking damage from them. But if you kept Cat alive in the previous mission, she lends you that much needed hand when you're most in a pinch. Oh, the guy behind me, are you going to hug all the fun? Cat, can't you go bother someone else? Let me help you out. I would say that Sector Z does leave a bit desired. I am a little disappointed that the missiles only come from the bottom portion of the screen. It takes a lot of the challenge away. But the combat is still a bit stressful. And Cat and her cute little vehicle is a nice addition. I was actually prepared to just rag on this level and avoid it entirely in the commentary. But watching the footage back, I can argue that Sector Z simulates a realistic high stakes flight encounter. The concept of protecting the larger craft with your tiny R wing is pretty cool. So I can't really fault Sector Z for that. In any case, it is a preemptive mission for the final portion of the game. So let's take some time to take that fight head first through the end stretch. You're on your own. Good luck, little man. Rob, is everything okay? Great Fox is okay. That was a close call. We've got the bad guys on the run! Don't worry! Let me here! Area 6, not 51. Who is Cayman, and why should I care? Cayman here. No problem. Do you copy? Emergency maneuvers! Too late. Game over, pal. I don't. But the sudden contrast in his dialogue is hilarious. Yes. Venom airspace. Back to the classic concept of taking the fight to Venom. Area 6 is filled with massive attack units, revolving satellites, missiles, and so much more. My ship is actually in danger of perishing. Very early in the level at that. Mm -hmm. 
Did we get him? Not yet, sir. Andrea starts paging Fox in the first half of the level just to taunt him. Ah, on the page to plow. Additionally, players can do a huge number for their hit counter by firing rapidly at the massive ships and locking onto the groups of enemy targets. Venom's enemy packed course is a throwback to the Venom of old, but of course the fun stops there when the enemy pilot directs to deploy it now. That was my best Cayman impression. I do not like this enemy leader. It is called Gorgon, and it is another slow, wait, and shoot type of boss. Shoot the tentacles, expose, destroy, plasma balls, wait, dodge, rinse, repeat, shoot. God, I'm getting sick of this. I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you destroy it in one go as soon as that portion's exposed. Otherwise, this fight drags on. Now look, in a narrative sense, I get it. It's got a massive laser beam, and I wouldn't want to get hit by that either. But the thing is, it's so easy to avoid. All you got to do is roll around the screen. I get that Gorgon is supposed to be a threatening mechanical menace, but it's a waiting game. And it does serve its purpose. It halts Fox's rapid progress through Venom airspace. But I'm a bit disappointed it couldn't have been more engaging. Whatever the case, you have to suffer through it. And once you do, you get to that glorious end game. Venom, the final battles. Aw, oh, nice! We get to skip all that Venom attack fluff. Don't get too cocky, Star Fox. Let's see how you handle our new ships. Well, I'll be damned. I guess not. We meet again, old friends. And just like last time, y'all are going down. All the baddies got little scuffs and scratches on their faces from the previous bouts. Considering we didn't actually tackle them on the hard route, this is a bit of an anachronism. But whatever. The bout's more challenging because they have upgraded armor, and there are pillars littered throughout the stage that are real easy to roll into. Team Wolf also brushes off any homing shots, so you do need to be pretty well versed in firing the lasers. I have to hand it to Team Wolf. This is a fun battle. It's not really that hard if you can pull off the somersaults and barrel rolls while keeping an eye on the radar. It's fun, though. Each Star Wolf segment definitely qualifies the potential for all range mode, something that I don't know if I really like that much otherwise. And their final bout is one to be remembered. It rewards you with plus 50 for each member, except Star Wolf, oddly enough, who only gives you plus 30. I don't know if they're trying to imply something about him, but it is a fun little encounter to have before you take the fight right through to Andros, and it's going to be spectacular. This can't be happening! There's one more to go! No way! I don't believe it! I'll go it alone from here. I've been waiting for you, Star Fox. You know that I control the galaxy. It's foolish to come against me. The path to Andros is indirect this time, so you actually have to choose the paths. The fight is the same early on, but take out the face and eyes, and Fox really gets to see the brains behind the madman. Only I have the brains to rule my life. So, Andros, you show your true form.
This is by far the hardest Andros battle yet, because if you don't take out those eyes early on, you have to roll around the screen, avoiding their speed and accuracy. It took me a hot minute before I could line them up and shoot them down. Once you do so, the brain is left exposed. But the fight is not any easier. Andros' brain will also chase Fox around and pose a serious threat to his R-Wing. It uses some form of telekinesis to disappear once the exterior is fired at, meaning you have to line up the shot with his exposed portion, the hypothalamus, I guess. Get too close, though, and he'll constrict your R-Wing and his brain tentacles. This can do a serious number on the R-Wing, and if you don't escape in time, Fox will suffer wing damage, making his R-Wing go limp. There is a trick here, though. If you do shoot at the core brain and make it disappear, if you roll around a little bit, you'll line up directly with the exposed portion. So all you really got to do is just stay vigilant about how you're flying and kind of hack through it. With that being said, the fight is done and Fox is on his way out. But Andros is determined to take him out with him. And so the screen starts exploding. Don't ever give up, my son. Father? Follow me, Fox. Papa McCloud. Yo, what's up, Pops? It's good to see that Fox's father has survived. That's a new thing. So it was kind of indirectly implied in the previous game that he had fought with Andros. In this one, it's pretty much just spelled out that Andros killed him. But you take the hard route all the way, and you find that he's well and alive. What was he even doing on Venom? Just hiding? Putting the sunglasses on? Getting a tan? I don't know, but he's leading us to our safety. So we gotta follow him. The path is actually a bit stressful if you've taken a lot of wing damage. And if your ship's flying kind of funky. Fortunately, mine's not. I'm, a, I'm an ace pilot. You know me. Your captain speaking. So we take the flight right out and get the same credit sequence as the past two paths. Ah, let's do some analysis. Our leader. All right. The fact that Andros is now tangible and not a robot is supposed to indicate his quote unquote true form. This becomes concrete in the credit sequence, because on the previous two paths, his face would still be in the clouds at the end. This actually sheds light on something that was a paradox in the previous game. So in the original Star Fox, when you take the longer routes, it's more difficult for no apparent reason other than a higher hit counter and an Andros face change. This indirectly implied that Andros' true form in the old game was an evil-looking bull, what I can consider to be a demon by SNES Polygon standards. <laughs> Looking at the brain and eyes, not that I necessarily want to, I get the sense that they're preserved. Think to like some spaceship science fiction movie where you see like those brains in jars. Um, I not Again, not that I necessarily want to, but that's what this reminds me of. This, in a sense, qualifies the final Andros bout as an epic encounter of sorts and does help to conclude the narrative of Star Fox 64's dilemma in a memorable way. Does that make it perfect? No. My biggest gripe has to be with the boss battles. The majority of them simply played out as waiting games, and that's unforgivable. 
The dreaded all range mode I can look past since they are a new segment and operate in varied and engaging ways that really don't dominate the flight paths and they still control pretty responsively. Even the Landmaster and Blue Marine are a fun diversion once in every level path. But half of the bosses are just time wasters. On the hard path, I would expect the most challenging and engaging bosses. But what do we get? We got a clam. We got a cannonball firing above water submarine. We got seven missiles. And we did get a cool Star, star Wolf battle. But then we got that Gorgon battle right before we went into Venom. I would hardly call anything other than the Star Wolf battle and the Andros battle highlights here. The combat for 64 had so much wasted potential because even the medium path outshone the hard one. Something's wrong here. And the thing is, just about every section that was on rails and R-Wing based and even Landmaster based had great combat throughout the majority of the level. Miyamoto said something with respect to the original game that he thinks he probably should have made it easier. Star Fox 64 doesn't aid in this case. It's way too much easier. And this actually reaffirms the stereotype that the Nintendo brand has been trying to escape ever since the 64 era. That it's kid friendly. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing that kids can play it. I'm just saying it's a bad thing that it's dumbed down. I have to fault Star Fox 64 in this regard because, look, when you talk about a boss battle, you shouldn't be talking about clams and you shouldn't be talking about robots that just stand around. There should be some actual fun gameplay here. And, you know, the thing is, I'm, I'm most upset and disappointed about it because I'm a spaceship shooting fan. I love these games. And this game was so well sold, but it still created this narrative of Star Fox 64 as easy. It is way too easy of a spaceship shooting game. And I don't beat that many of them. I'm not saying this needs to be impossible to play, but I am saying that I would like a more memorable experience when fighting through the bosses. So now that I've got my piece out, I do have to commend it. Because, yes, there is amazing dialogue, and there's some great characters, and the environments are beautiful, especially if you play this game on the 3DS. Boy, that game looks good. But the real home run hitter is still the combat. It's the greatest fault and its greatest potential. I love going through every stage and trying to get a high score, trying to get a medal. I don't know if I love trying to keep my teammates alive, but you do have to do so if you want to earn a medal. And firing frantically yet focused blasts at enemies to try and get that high score is part of that narrative. The other thing, too, was I ordered this game off eBay before doing this narrative analysis, and the previous owner had some scores that were not that impressive. I got to be completely honest. But seeing those scores and seeing them preserved in the transaction process is beautiful. I love that you could pass on these cartridges to someone else. So say, for instance, I give my copy of Star Fox 64 to Alex from Turbo Zone. Now he's got my high scores to look at and try and beat. That means if I was going to send him this game, I would try and make sure my scores were high as possible. And that's a beautiful thing. I love that it brings back the arcade culture. The arcade culture of getting the high score, and beating your friend's high scores and showing off. It's fun. This is a game where I like to show off. And it does make you feel that importance too with Team Fox and his other members. Falco is always competing with you. He's always trying to get down the ships. And there's so much aspect of competition here that it does make that combat shine. And you know, it's a fun, well-controlled, responsive game. And to accomplish that, with that Nintendo 64 controller that I'm looking at right now, well, boy, is that special. And you know what? I think all of that is testament to Star Fox 64's potential as a member of the spaceship shooting genre. What? <laughs>